la 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 lemon. La 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 light bulb. I guess. La 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 lamp post. This is fun. La 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 in my oatmeal. I think we're almost there. I just I was thinking. Hello and welcome to our podcast on alliteration, another one of our many literary terms that we're going to be looking at this year. Let's go ahead and find out what exactly this is. So what exactly is alliteration? Alliteration is the repeating of the same or similar consonant sounds in words. Uh, and again, a consonant is one of our letters other than A, E, I, O, or U, so the vowels. Um, you know, it could just be that two words next to each other start with the same consonant sound. Uh, it could be that we have a long line of repetition of that same consonant sound. So why do authors use alliteration? You know, at a surface level, you start to hear the rhythm of the language, the musicality of the language. Things start to get some, you know, meter to them, some rhythmic qualities to it. And so that's what you notice at the literal level. But then, as always, we have to ask ourselves, why are they choosing to have this repetition? And the biggest question is, how does this help us understand the text's theme? And again, the theme is the author's comment on the human condition. So basically, what is the author trying to say about being human? Or what is the author trying to say about life through this text? And our biggest question is, when we observe one of these literary terms, like alliteration, how does that help us understand what their point is? So literal level is identifying it. Hey, there's alliteration. But that interpretive level is, so what? So what that they're using alliteration? How does that make any difference in the message they're trying to send through this text? So here are some examples of alliteration just to kind of get us to start hearing it. And again, alliteration is the repetition of consonant sounds at the beginnings of words. So from Emily Dickinson, she writes, We passed the fields of grazing grain. We passed the setting sun. And so in the first line, we hear the G's being repeated. In the second line, we hear the S's. And so, yes, even though there's only two words that are repeated, that still is alliteration. It doesn't have to be some massive, long line of poetry. Example number two from Edgar Allan Poe. He writes, Brazen bells, what a tale of terror. Now their turbulency tells. And so we hear the repetition of the B's in the first line and then the repetition of the T's in that second line. And so again, it's like literal level, we identify he's using alliteration, great. But now we need to move on to that interpretive level and say, okay, why is he using that? Is it simply just to add some rhythm to it? Or is there a deeper connection to uh, the point he's trying to make with this poem? And we have to try to start to make those interpretations. Example three comes from LL Cool J. It says, I'm the lady's love, legend in leather, long and lean, and I don't wear pleather. And so pleather is, you know, like fake leather, I guess, or something like that. But again, you hear the repetition of L's over and over in this line. And so example number four, representing the West, relevant to relentless sentences. If renegade rebels resent this wicked syntax, revert to revolution, Raz reverses, reverberates, revolving with written retaliation. And so we get this long stanza of uh, repetition of R sounds. And you can even notice that last line, that even though revolving with written retaliation doesn't all start with the actual letter R, we do get the consonant sound of R being repeated. And so that is technically alliteration. And here is an example from Run DMC. Now Peter, Piper, pick peppers, but run rock, run, Humpty, Dumpty, fell down, that's his heart, time, Jackie, nimble, what, nimble, and he was quick, but jam, mass mud, back to Jack, saw Jay's dick. Met a little bull, beef, cold, lost a sheep, and Rip Van Winkle fell a hell asleep. And out of tune, the summer in Wonderland, Jack turned Jill Bucket in his hand. His damn left to see, making out that sound, the turntable's my wobble, but it don't fall down. And so on the last couple slides here, take a minute, go ahead and pause this whenever you get a chance, and see if you can identify the alliteration in each example. And one more example to practice identifying alliteration. Sally sells seashells by the shiny seashore so she can see the shimmering silver ships. In sunshiny summer she strolls along the seashore, shoelessly splashing somersaults while she skips. 
Sally sells seashells by the shiny seashore so she can see the shimmering silver ships. In sunshiny summer, she strolls along the seashore, shoelessly splashing somersaults while she skips. Sally sells seashells by the shiny seashore so she can see the shimmering silver ships. In sunshiny summer, she strolls along the seashore, shoelessly splashing somersaults while she skips. Shoelessly splashing somersaults while she skips. And good, so a pretty short podcast for us here, but hopefully you can start to identify uh, alliteration and seeing that in lines of poetry or perhaps even prose, which are, you know, texts that are not poetry. Um, but make sure that you can define what alliteration is. And then, of course, we want to move towards that deeper level of what is the point of alliteration? Why do authors use it? And how does identifying alliteration help us uncover the writer's theme? You know, what are they trying to say about life, about humanity, about being human? You know, those deeper issues. That's the point we want to be making. Not just that we can identify it, but that we can look at it and go, what's their point? What is the so what of that alliteration? Great. So if you have any questions, as always, bring those to class, bring your notes, and we will start applying this right away. Thanks so much for listening, and have a good one. function of what and what I am is a man in a mask. Well, I can see that. Of course you can. I'm not questioning your powers of observation. I'm merely remarking upon the paradox of asking a masked man who he is. Oh, right. But on this most auspicious of nights, permit me then, in lieu of the more commonplace sobriquet, to suggest the character of this dramatis persona. Voila! In view, a humble vaudevillian veteran, cast vicariously as both victim and villain by the vicissitudes of fate. This visage, no mere veneer of vanity, is a vestige of the vox populi, now vacant, vanished. However, this valorous visitation of a bygone vexation stands vivified and has vowed to vanquish these venal and virulent vermin, vanguarding vice and vouchsafing the violently vicious and voracious violation of volition.